This year has been a crazy year. I've had the privilege of getting to witness and explore so much of creation on film and document my adventures of doing so. As the year comes to a close, I wanted to share with you all a curated list of my favorite wildlife photography adventures for you to enjoy. At the beginning of this year, I pumped the gas on a new and exciting way to capture wildlife photography. One of my favorite birds to ever exist is the stunning vermilion flycatcher. I had a vision to capture its wings spread on its approach to a perch, and to my excitement, I captured it just as imagined. Here's the plan, and here's how I did it. In this video, I'm gonna be photographing wildlife using only this remote shutter here. The hard part is this bird is one of the rarest in my area. As you can see in this range map below, this particular bird isn't even supposed to be here. I've been studying this vermilion flycatcher before today on multiple visits and trying to find what perches he likes to land on. In wildlife photography, predicting the behavior of an animal can yield some amazing results. But what I'm trying to do today is extra special because I have a vision of capturing this bird incredibly close up with its wings full spread in flight. This means that I'll need to get closer than I ever have to this bird without scaring it, while having my camera set up at the perfect angle. Upon arrival today, I took a quick inventory of some of my surroundings and noticed a couple of different animal species from the common ground squirrels to the white crowned sparrows of my area. Most notably, I got to watch a California scrub jay bury an acorn in front of me. These guys are known for burying hidden catches of food storage in the ground and are quite protective of their food. One of the things that will help us achieve the shot of the vermilion flycatcher is their unique behavior of flycatching. Flycatching is known as when a bird will fly off a perch to catch a bug in midair, only to return to the exact same location on the perch. After studying this vermilion flycatcher over multiple trips, I've discovered that it really likes to spend most of its day perched along four perches in this canal. Three out of those four perches are really bad angles or inaccessible. So our goal today is gonna to be trying to use this perch right back here to get some good shots since it's at eye level and offers some good lighting and we can get pretty close up to it. Now the challenge was coming. After setting up the camera angle in the correct spot, it was time to move away from the perch that we had set up for. I attached the remote shutter to the camera and prepared for some shots of the flycatcher. Using a remote shutter for wildlife is gonna allow the vermilion flycatcher to feel more comfortable and enabled to approach the perch rather than if we were standing right next to the camera since it's so close. It would feel intimidated by our presence. This perch, however, is definitely the least used of the four perches I talked about. So it's gonna take a little bit of time and patience for him to land in the right area, but I'm confident that eventually this shot is gonna pay off. After spending a few hours waiting for the bird to take to the perch, there was finally a moment where the bird flew up towards the perch and took to it. But unfortunately, the moment was slightly missed. So close, we got the shot, but unfortunately we got him approaching from a little bit lower than the perch. So at the moment where we get his wings spread and he's almost in focus, um, he's slightly behind the twig and I don't really like that about this shot. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna just wait around a little bit more. Hopefully we get a better chance next time where he approaches more from a top angle and we can get his full body spread um, open, get his chest all the way down to his feet and his wings spread open. So we're gonna try again to see if we uh, are successful next time. Even though my first chance had failed, I wasn't going to give up that easily. After waiting around for almost another hour, I had a second opportunity at catching him on camera. All right, you guys, let's check and see if we got the shot this time. We had a higher approach from the vermilion flycatcher, so I have a really good feeling about this one. Ooh, oh my gosh. Oh, oh, that is the perfect moment. Oh my goodness, you guys, we got the shot with his wings spread wide open, full body is visible. That is just an amazing image right there. Oh my goodness. Before leaving, I decided to make one more attempt at getting the bird with a little more green in the background by raising the camera angle. And I had one more encounter with the bird returning and I was able to capture a stunning image of him flying once again. There are few colors you'll ever see so vivid as that of the vermilion flycatchers. 
If you've been following me for over a year, you know that I went through an intensive jaw surgery to say the very least. A couple of months after my recovery, I discovered that the hospital I got my surgery at was actually the home to a roost of roughly 10,000 American crows every night. This mystified me and I started to envision a way to capture these eerie creatures in the middle of the night. Through over a month of planning and execution, I planned out a way to capture these birds under the light of the full moon. Here's the story of how it went. What can I do different? As a wildlife photographer, it can be easy to go out and get the same shot over and over again. Recently, I've decided to try to photograph something I've never done before in the middle of the night. I've been pushing myself to achieve new goals in wildlife photography, especially with new levels of creativity. When you've scrolled through Instagram for hours looking for something inspirational, it can be hard to find something new. But when I looked outside and noticed what was right outside my everyday workspace, I realized I had the opportunity of a lifetime to capture something different. And this is that story. Since it's winter, I've been working at my office till sunset regularly every day. Recently, I've noticed that during each day's sunset, the city's very own murder of crows, what an awesome name for this creepy bird, comes to stop by right outside my office window on their way to their roost. However, almost as quickly as they arrive, within 15 minutes, they've all passed by and the streets are quiet again. I never knew where the crow's roost was for my big city of half a million people, so the other day I decided to follow them at sunset and see where they wound up going. This led me to the entrance of the hospital, and believe it or not, the hospital in which I got my horrific jaw surgery four months ago. Each night, they seemingly amass to the hospital building to decide the victims of their murder. Of course, referring to the guano, they seem to pleasantly scatter all over the ground, not an actual killing. In order to create a good image, I have a vision of capturing this nighttime shot of a crow backlit by the moon. I'll have to take into account three things. One, I'll be needing a decently well-lit moon, so I'm planning to shoot right on the full moon on February 16th. Secondly, I'll be having to plan out the time of the moonrise in accordance with the positioning of the birds. The most effective altitude angle would be roughly seven degrees, meaning that on February 16th, the best time to photograph these American crows would be at 6.40 p.m. Lastly, in order to capture the details of the moon such as the dark spots, I'll need to shoot a crow at quite a far distance away, meaning that instead of using the crows close up on the trees, I'll have to photograph a crow on the ledge of the hospital. It's the 16th of February now with about 15 minutes left till sunset. I'm sitting here with my flamingo socks on and any minute now, I'll most likely start hearing a chorus of cause right outside the window of my office. This whole ordeal took quite a bit of planning. Not only did I have to figure out the timing of the crows and where they roost with previous scouting trips, but I also had to figure out the timing of the moon, when it's becoming a full moon and what latitude it's going to be viable to capture these shots. In. The scary part about all this is that we only have one night to pull all this off with all the correct elements coming together in order to get the shot. Ooh, okay. I think I hear some. Okay, yeah, so I see them flying down onto a tree out in the distance. Not as many as I normally sometimes get lately around here at sunset, but it's a decent amount of them and I think it's starting, so this is exciting. So what's interesting is uh, the crows are stopped just a little bit down from my street, right where my office is this morning. They've stopped at a slightly different location on their way back at sunset, but we've just got this gorgeous view of just literally hundreds out in the distance. No, thousands out in the distance flying in at sunset in this direction. And I'm so excited for the opportunities we're gonna be getting tonight. So it looks like this is the moment. They're all starting to take off and uh, getting going towards uh, the hospital. So we're gonna be following them right now and seeing just kind of how this is. Look at that, that is crazy. They're all just starting to take off towards the hospital.
It was like a train of crows streaking across the night sky as we followed them down the street. On our way back to the hospital, I wound up stopping by a location beforehand in which they all seemed to momentarily stop by before heading to their roost just post-sunset. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That is an insane amount of crows all around. This is literally like 2,000, 3,000 crows at least. No, that's, oh my gosh. The tree just looks like it's leaves of crows on it. <laughs> insane. That's probably gonna be at least 5,000 crows around here. And more just keep pouring in. As twilight was drawing to a close, we arrived at the top of the hospital parking garage to witness a tornado of crows approaching the hospital. Thousands upon thousands of these American crows swarmed the entrance claiming their sleeping spot for the night amidst the building ledges and empty tree branches. If you've never witnessed a spectacle of nature so closely intertwined with humanity before, it's quite a marvel of an experience to see. While we have lots of work to do as humanity on improving our relations with the natural world, it's interesting to watch those that thrive and getting to see nature so up close. So as the sunlit sky disappeared, my moment began to arise for me to capture the shot I was hoping for against the beautiful nightlit sky. As the moon was barely starting to dip up through some of the lower elevations in the hospital building, I loved getting to capture some images of crows flying towards the ledges of the hospital, and I pulled away with a few shots that were a great example of where the mood of the night was headed. While waiting for the moon to rise into the correct position, I started to experiment with the lighting on the building to make some creative shots. As I was scanning the facility, I noticed a windsock that held a light inside of it. Luckily, these American crows were very used to the presence of people, and some were hanging out in the trees right beside me at eye level, only an arm's length away from my reach. I searched for the correct angle, and using a crow on a tree nearby and using this feature in the background, I was able to craft a beautiful image that felt like a flame flickering in the background of a silhouetted crow. This image was a pleasant and unplanned surprise and I was thrilled to capture my first bird photography image with what felt like a fire flickering in the background. It's amazing what you can capture when you keep your eyes open and aware and experiment with new concepts and ideas. Wildlife photography can become very routine and very standard in its vision, but today I would continue to disprove that idea. Before taking the grand finale image of the day, I would find myself using other building concepts and lighting to create unique images of the crows perched around the facility. My favorite of these attempts wound up being this one here, using the window light hitting against the exterior wall of the building to create a silhouetted crow on a tree out in the distance. Finally, the time was here. The moment had come where the moon was correctly set in the sky to photograph crows in the distance along the building's edge in order to capture not only a silhouette of a crow, but the moon slightly in focus. After walking around for the correct angle to photograph it from and finding the correct subject, I lined up my composition and fired off some shots of the moody night sky. This adventure, while far from pure nature, was exciting and challenged me to continue to see the world in a unique and different perspective. I was glad I was finally able to capture this dream image of mine I had planned for over a month. Using my creative vision and the surrounding available to me in my city, I was empowered to create photos that few have dreamt of. And now, I'm inspired to see what I can dream up next. The American Crows were an unforgettable experience. However, they weren't the only dark and moody photos that I captured this past year. Last year, wildfire tore apart most of the mountain forest nearby my home. And while this wreaked havoc on the environment, new life was born through the charcoal burnt forests. A specific bird called the black-backed woodpecker thrives in these types of environments. This bird is hard for me to find, and I've spent months and countless outings searching for it before. So when I found a location of theirs this past summer, it was thrilling to see what I could capture here. Here's the story of how beauty can rise out of the ashes. In this video, I'm searching for the rare woodpecker species in my area called the black-backed woodpecker. For the past three years, I've been studying this rare bird to try to figure out how to capture it in the summertime when I have access to the high mountain peaks of the Sierra Nevadas. 
I'll be sharing these tricks as the days go on, as I learned how to recognize where they would be and how to capture them. One of the unique things about it is that it commonly lives amongst burnt down forests of one to eight years in age. And today, I'm out journeying in an area burnt down by last year's wildfires. Wildfires are becoming more and more prevalent with the likely correlation to climate change. Last year, the Creek Fire in the Sierra Nevadas nearby my home coated the sky in orange clouds for a month straight. While these wildfires can be devastating, they can also offer new opportunities and life in the year to follow. The trick to knowing how to photograph a rare bird like the black-backed woodpecker is doing your research and knowing where to look. While burnt down forests can be a hot spot for many different species of woodpeckers, black-backed woodpeckers specifically search out for these burnt down forests and thrive amongst them. As I walked through the forest, I took a stop at an area in which I noticed a family of white-headed woodpeckers living together. There seemed to be two adults foraging on different trees with young white-headeds following closely behind them. Most woodpecker babies are coming out of their nests now and learning to navigate the techniques of foraging and feeding taught to them by their parents. White-headed woodpeckers have a diet consisting mainly of pine cones and in the warmer months, insects. They scale the bark on a tree probing in between the crevices in search of food. As they scale through the bark looking for insects, they fly tree to tree in their search. Interestingly, you might often find them clinging to the bottom of pine cones and prying them open from below, as to avoid getting sap on their feathers. But while I wasn't able to capture this behavior, I was able to capture a video in which you can see one snatching an insect. Approaching around the other side of me was a hairy woodpecker as well. Hairy woodpeckers are often a little more intentional with their work and spend time in one place a little longer than just running up and down a tree. After spending just a short while with it, I found this one great angle between two trees to capture this image. I was thrilled to be able to spend a good hour with the white-headed woodpeckers before leaving them. I had several moments in which they were incredibly bold and came down eye level with me right at the base of tree trunks, and I captured some great images during my time with them. I decided to continue my pursuit of the black-backed woodpecker and move into a clearing of burnt down trees. Along the way, I bumped into a female and male pair of Williamson's sapsuckers, which was quite a treat. As their name suggests, they maintain and harvest from wells of sap that they create, flowing out of coniferous trees. But during nesting season, they also begin to include ants and other small insects in their diet. These birds are fun birds to watch because they are incredibly hyperactive and constantly jump around from tree to tree at often low levels. This means I was able to get close to record them. However, it also meant that they were deeper dug in behind the leaves of smaller trees more often. And as a result, I had fun recording them, but no phenomenal shots along the way. I walked out to the clearing of burnt forest that I decided to spend my time at. There were American robins scouring the ground for worms and other insects, red-breasted nuthatches calling from everywhere and climbing the trees. And even at one special moment, I got the treat of seeing a friendly black-headed grosbeak on the fringe of the burnt down forest. Usually, these birds are neither human friendly nor positioned low down on trees to get good shots. But this one came right up to me as I walked by and I was able to get some exciting shots of him as he foraged through the pine needles looking for some seeds. I was enjoying exploring this new territory, looking tree after tree of black bark. I inspected them all and then it happened. That's their call. I think I just heard them. Guys, that's the black-headed woodpeckers. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's incredible. So the lighting is really gnarly right now. I got here a little bit late this morning and uh, 
I've been here for like two, three hours already. So it's a little bit too harsh to get any good shots of them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna wait around a little bit, observe a little bit of their patterns, their behaviors, but not try to get any photographs necessarily today and come back the next day uh, really early in the morning before sunrise, get up at 3, 3.30 and uh, make sure I can get some shots. This is perfect territory for them. So just like I expected, found them here. I'm really excited about this. I couldn't believe that I had finally found them in a photographable environment. The feeling of this burnt forest felt a little otherworldly, and if I was lucky, this morning I would capture them foraging amongst the burnt trees of the clearing. White-headed woodpeckers and hairy woodpeckers once again started to flood the forest, but as the sunrise started to rise over the treetops in the distance, I started to see a family of black-backed woodpeckers flying into the burnt grove from across the way. Seeing their behavior yesterday, I knew what I needed to do to get good shots of them. Firstly, I took some safety shots from a distance just to get them on camera. I tried to explore a few good wide angles for 10 minutes or so as the sun rose. In the midst of this process, not only did I capture a unique wide shot light on a white-headed woodpecker, but I also managed to capture a really cool moment in which a hairy woodpecker and a black-headed woodpecker were framed symmetrically of one another on opposing sides of this tree trunk in the distance. This image also shows the black-headed woodpecker's famous behavior of flaking off chunks of bark to reveal the insects underneath. This is also called scaling, and this knowledge of how they forage would be the trick for how to capture them well. Black-headed woodpeckers are very deliberate foragers, spending healthy amounts of time at one spot on the tree. And often, that spot tends to be lower. While many woodpeckers forage high up, black-headed woodpeckers commonly forage down low. As I approached them closer and closer over the next hour, I was careful to observe their behavior so as to naturally work into their environment. I discovered which trees they were working on in the process and positioned myself accordingly. While filming them, I got to witness so many cool moments between the parents and young. At one moment, I was able to show the process of a father feeding its son, learning how to forage behind it. Flying amongst the charcoal trees of the creek fire and blending in with their beautiful midnight blue feathers, I watched them interact with each other as a family and feed for the next hour and a half as I tested out different angles of how to capture them. I found myself blown away by contrast and colors that I was able to capture in this burnt forest at sunrise. Almost from another planet, the lighting ignited these dead trees in a majestic way. For just a few short moments on that third day, I was able to capture these images of them before they flew off. What an incredible adventure, getting to finally capture a bird I have been attempting to find for three years. And their existence is a beautiful metaphor for how life can rise out of seemingly dead things. How can we see the world more like them? There's something serene about the ocean when you're able to be out on a remote beach somewhere all on your own. The vastness, the expanse, it really allows you to breathe in and process life in a different way. During spring migration, I decided to take a day to head to the coast a few hours away and see what I could find. While I knew I would enjoy it, I had no idea I was about to witness an abundance of incredible nature moments that I would watch take place in one single day, and I would walk away experiencing possibly the best single day of wildlife photography I've ever experienced in my life. I hope you enjoy. I've traveled from hours away today to get shots of shorebirds at sunrise, but I only have one morning to get the images I'm looking for. Little did I know the stories of struggle and triumph that were to come in this single morning would be even better than I had hoped for. Fittingly, after spending the previous night in the Sandpiper Inn in Morro Bay, I set out to get to my destination pre-sunrise. These sunrise shots of shorebirds often look best just before the sun actually rises, so my goal is to be able to get there with 30 minutes to spare. 
Almost immediately, our first problem arose. Our parking lot nearby the remote beach I was going to was closed. Flustered that I would now miss these sunrise shots that I had traveled so far for, I started driving a ways back up the road and found a pullout that had a trail leading down to the same beach. Grabbing my gear, I quickly set out in a scramble to try to get there in time. If I wasn't rushed, this hike would have actually been stunning to get to take in and enjoy. Moro Rock sat beautifully out in the distance, just above the fog layer, and I grabbed some shots of it in purple light. Along the way, I ran into a California scrub jay early morning in the dark and grabbed this shot here as well of the familiar bird. As I approached the sand spit, the sound of crashing ocean waves grew louder and louder. Amazingly, after rushing to the beach, I arrived just in time to pull off a couple of shots pre-sunrise while the lighting was still soft on the birds. Getting shorebirds at eye level can be challenging, but thanks to my new skimmer ground pod from Hunt's photo and video, I was well equipped. This skimmer ground pod allows me to get down eye level with the shorebirds easily while keeping it from falling in the sand. In addition, it allows me to be mobile and slide around easily, rather than having to pick up and readjust a tripod every single time. As the sun was rising, I began to capture its warmth against the cool blue ocean water. These sanderlings glowed in the distance as I captured them preening and scurrying around. One of the cool aspects of it all was that due to it being spring migration, many of these sanderlings are molting at different stages, which allowed me opportunities to capture some in angelic blank white colors and others in rich reddish tan colors. As they foraged through the wet sand, I was able to capture stunning images of these color contrasts. As they grouped up and foraged as a unit, I was also able to capture some cool moments of them side by side. Watching these little guys was such a cute and comical experience. One particular sanderling I was observing was on a hot streak finding sand crabs and digging them up to devour. Then, off to the side, I began to notice another sanderling eyeing his meal. Hilariously, this little thief was contemplating stealing the other's meal. When the other wasn't looking, this little buddy charged in and runs off with his meal. Furiously, the other sanderling chases him down, but was unsuccessful in re-obtaining his breakfast. So, the search continued for another sand crab along the shoreline, and this time, the sanderling was prepared. As other sanderlings began to surround and approach him, he defended his territory and chased them down so that he could successfully enjoy his meal. It's funny seeing such a cute, tiny, fluffy bird act feistily with its buddies like this. But nature doesn't play favorites. A lot of hard work finally paid off for such an essential breakfast meal during its spring migration. Good job, little guy. One vision I had for the day was capturing Moro Rock in the distant background behind a sandpiper or plover to give a beautiful wildlife photography scenic image to encompass the story of my day there. However, the fog layer above the ocean was too thick down low, and all morning long I couldn't get any catches of it in the background. I did, however, wind up getting some other wider shots of wimbrels and sanderlings that I liked, and this one here with a big crashing wave in the background wound up being one of my favorites. Wimbrels are extraordinary birds as well. Their curved beaks make them excellent at probing for food in the mud, and they were fun to watch forage for the morning. As I was getting in shots of birds along the shoreline, I noticed a western gull far off in the distance walking. As I looked to where it was headed, I noticed a turkey vulture standing over carry-on at that moment that I wasn't able to identify. Something must have washed up from the ocean or shore, and so taking advantage of this opportunity, I decided to move a little closer. I could tell it seemed to be some sort of large fish or something of the sort. The turkey vulture seemed to be having a great time eating his newfound meal, and while the adult western gull didn't want to seem to wait around for it, a smaller juvenile gull made his way over to the feast hoping to get a bite in. The pecking order of nature goes like this. The bigger, the stronger, the priority on who eats first. While this gull may have been hungry, 
the turkey vulture didn't feel like sharing his meal. And so for the next half hour, I crept closer and watched as this turkey vulture feasted and the gull circled his trophy hoping for just a scrap. Occasionally, the vulture would wander off a little bit and the gull would build up enough courage to go in and pick up a scrap of food. But even when he did this, the vulture would immediately come charging back to fend him off. As the vulture feasted, I was able to capture some pretty cool moody images of him eating at sunrise. Eventually, the vulture wandered far enough off to where the gull took up his opportunity to snag a bite. <laughs> Without hesitating, he swooped in and got a mouthful of entrails. How gorgeous. But for him, this was a needed snack. This moment didn't last long, however, as of course the vulture came running back to claim his territory, and so the cycle restarted. What an interesting story to come across on this day at the beach, and how exciting to capture on film. A while later, both birds wound up leaving the carry-on, and I went over to inspect what it was. Now, if you're squeamish, I recommend skipping forward 15 seconds in the video because it was pretty gross, but this is what it wound up being. I'm not a huge ocean wildlife guy, so I don't really know what it was, but whatever it was, it was pretty huge at six or seven feet long and pretty terrifying as well. I moved back away and soon after, another turkey vulture swooped on in and took his turn at the breakfast table. Now, my biggest hope for today was to be able to capture a snowy plover at some point. I've never seen one and always wanted to photograph one, but unfortunately, as the day got later and later, I knew my chances were running thin. While I was waiting around photographing the vultures, to my excitement, a semi-palmated plover flew in and landed right in my shooting path. Not as snowy, but still exciting, as it was my first plover of the day that I got to photograph. Plovers are so fun to watch run around and dodge in and out of corners of kelp. Semi-palmated plovers are beautifully striped birds with gorgeous features, and at one moment, while it was approaching me, I wound up getting this stunning image of it against the warm and smooth fine-grained sand surrounding it. While I was watching this little guy run around, I wasn't seeming to get any other good angles on it. Just as I thought my day was coming to a close, you'll never believe what happened next. A pair of snowy plovers flew right on top of my location where I was lying prone and just sat there to relax. This video here was taken literally right from where it landed beside me and I hadn't moved an inch. I couldn't believe my luck. After traveling from hours away and searching all morning to find just one, Two presented themselves right on my doorstep, and I got to witness some incredible moments with these cute little guys. As I watched them, one was starting to come a bit more active while the other was off taking a nap to the side. I followed them around through the viewfinder of my camera as they searched for food amidst the sandy kelp mountains. But the most amazing moment was yet to come. As they foraged, one started to move to an angle relative to me with much better lighting. Not only that, but it was beginning to walk up perfectly in line with Morro Rock, now unveiled by the sun. The pinnacle of scenery in the Morro Bay area, and the shot that I was praying for and imagining when I planned the trip. Not only being able to capture a scenic shot with Morro Rock in the background, but even better, capturing it with the most coveted bird of the trip, the snowy plover. All of these elements were beginning to align perfectly, and as the plover approached, I knew my moment had come, and so I pulled my finger to the shutter and I fired off the shot that I was dreaming of. To my amazement, as I was walking back to the car through the sand dune hills, I ran across a pair of California quail foraging. Quail are so skittish in my area and I never get the opportunity to capture them. So taking advantage of a beautiful lighting opportunity, I captured a portrait image of a gorgeous male standing watch over a female foraging below. It's amazing to watch the stories of food being fought for, territories being defended, and special moments that I get to capture as a photographer out in nature. What a beautiful creation and I'm so thankful that I had the privilege of encountering these magnificent creatures on a magical morning 
at the beach. So when I reflect on my favorite wildlife photography experience of the year, it's hard to claim just one, but there was one project that stood out to me above all the rest consistently and has been hard to forget since it happened. I'm a sucker for vast open expanses and spaces, rolling green hills and cliff vistas. So when I discovered a roost of white-throated swifts on the side of a cliff about an hour and a half away from my home, I was determined to get some shots of these aerial fighter jets flying and dive bombing through the air. They are by far one of the most difficult subjects I've ever had to capture. But being up there on the top of the cliffs, being able to see for miles around me in a 360 view, made this to be one of the most breathtaking experiences of my life over the few days I worked with them. And capturing the shots I was hoping for at the end made it all a thousand times worth it. Here's the most exciting wildlife photography adventure I embarked on in 2022. In this video, I'm climbing this mountain cliff in order to get some shots of some of the world's fastest known birds. The hard part is that they are incredibly fast, flying at speeds believe close to 200 miles per hour, making them difficult to track in flight and hard to photograph so high in the air. I've been studying white-throated swifts and been looking to run into a colony around my area. The other day, I was walking down a canyon and heard them calling from far away. Today, I'm returning to visit them at what I believe to be a roosting colony along the edge of that mountain cliff there in order to get some shots of them I've never been able to achieve before. To do this, we will have to not only be able to track them in flight, but we will also need to be able to get eye level with them high up in the air. This particular scenario brings up a couple of challenges. First, we will have to discover the best angle to photograph these guys from. Since I've been here before, I know that they stay high up in the air and only come down in order to land on their roosting cliff. Therefore, I'll be climbing to the top of this peak here to capture them as they descend to their landing base. This location will provide me a clear and open line of sight at eye level in order to get close up shots of them with good looking backgrounds. The second problem we encounter is that of tracking these birds in flight. Known to be some of the world's fastest birds, they are incredibly tricky to not only follow with a camera, but also to nail focus correctly. Autofocus will most likely fail at such high speeds of movement with such a tiny bird. So in order to capture the shot, I'll be using a manual focus technique called pre-focusing in order to capture the shots I'm looking for. Today's going to be an intense day and definitely going to put my skills to the test. I'm pretty comfortable shooting manual focus, but I've never tried with such a fast species as this. Not only that, but it's gonna be difficult framing the birds in the first place as well. So I'm really excited for the day and definitely up for the challenge. Now, the fun part is getting there. Seeing that mountain out in the distance against that sunrise gave me an excitement for the day. I started my climb summiting a first hill not far from the parking spot. It was a lot steeper than expected and to be honest, after a while of climbing, I was pretty shot by the time I hit the top of it. However, when I reached the top, I saw a new perspective of my home in a way that was sort of breathtaking. It might not look like much, but this vast stretch of land out here in the distance, that's my home, the place where I go to rest and replenish. And as I was working to approach the home of these white-throated swifts, I was excited for this day that was looming ahead of me, and I was imagining the shots that I would be able to capture atop the mountain. Along the way, I ran into a pocket of sparrows on the top of a plateau. In previous years, this larger general area provided me some of my favorite experiences with a fun bird called the sagebrush sparrow. And this encounter with some white-crowned and savannah sparrows gave me some good memories to look back on. Wildlife photography is about so much more than just the photos. It's the complete experience of the day. From the details in the footprints in the grass, the hiking to get to the location, and the views you see while out adventuring, it all makes it feel special, surreal, and more grand than anything else you experience in life. At first, I decided to hang out on the bottom side of the cliff for a while to observe the patterns of these white-throated swift up close and find out where I could best position myself for success with these guys. Their flock seemed to kind of float around within a mile's radius of the cliff. Sometimes there would be empty sky around me, but then suddenly I would see a flock of them come streaking back towards me at lightning speed. 
as I assumed, they stayed way too high up in the air to get any good shots of from this position and only came down to land on the cliff. I did notice, however, that they seemed to be hovering just right above the ground occasionally on one side of the cliff as a part of their pattern. Observing this behavior, I knew exactly what I needed to do and started heading up to the final destination. All right, you guys, so now comes the time to put my skills to the test. I found a comfy spot up here on this grassy hill, and now I'm, all I'm gonna do is wait for these white-throated swift to swing back around and get eye level with me so I can get some shots. Currently, I'm working with the technique called pre-focusing in which I'm essentially setting my focus point to a certain depth of field, something like 20 feet away, and waiting for the white-throated swift to cross through that plane of field. I'll be at a high shutter speed in burst mode, that way as they cross that depth of field, I'm able to capture some shots of them. Swifts are unbelievably fast. I've had encounters with them before, but never tried so intently to get a photograph of one. Honestly, I've never been able to get a photograph of one. Watching them soar through the sky like fighter jets and dive bomb down into the earth made for some awesome camera tracking chases. One of my winning images of the day, in my humble opinion, came with this image of one dive bombing and a snow-capped mountain in the background. Now, it was just time to capture a close-up of the little fighter jet itself. Man, I'll tell you what's even trickier than getting a good photograph of these white-throated swift. It's getting some decent footage. For uh, video, I can't use the technique of pre-focusing because I would only make for a good couple seconds of footage as they pass through that depth of field. So I'm having to use a technique called follow focus in which I'm literally just following them back and forth with my focus ring. But not only that, but what makes it also difficult is that they can turn on a dime, making it really difficult to track them not only in a Z depth of field axis, but also with an X and a Y axis. While I was recording the birds flying by at supersonic speeds, I was able to capture this one moment of the swift snagging a bug in midair. The view looking out into the distance behind the swifts darting in front of me, the climb and adventure to get here, and now I couldn't believe I was experiencing one of the most thrilling moments of my wildlife photography career. After working hard for hours using manual focus, I was able to pull off some beautiful images and was able to satisfy the desire of capturing this incredible bird that thrives amongst the vertical heights of nature. This creative wide shot lens flare of these swifts soaring by captured me a memory of the whole experience on top of the world, as well as this beautiful portrait shot I'd worked so hard to get. How amazing is a world in which we get to stand at the edges of mountains and cliffs and watch nature's tiny little fighter jets zoom across the atmosphere. Amidst a 200 mile per hour lifestyle, I was only able to notice its beauty when I slowed down and took the time to watch it. I hope that you enjoyed getting to experience with me once again my favorite wildlife photography adventures of the year. Thanks so much to all of my subscribers who support me, watch me, and invest into caring about my wildlife photography career. It's truly been an amazing journey I've gotten to embark on so far, and I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to do what I do with you. As I head into this upcoming year, I'll be reframing a bunch of things with my channel and where I'm headed, and I'm excited to take you all along with me with the big and exciting things we have coming up. I hope that you can reflect on your 2022 with a similar fondness, and I'm looking forward to sharing 2023 with you all. If you want to see a short video on my favorite 10 images I photographed in 2022, I'd recommend checking out this video here in the end screen.
Until next time.